Now some difficult circumstances, either due to uh, tricky procedures or tricky patients. And it's very useful to think about these before you're actually faced with them because trying to process and come up with sensible solutions on the fly can be very challenging. Pericardiocentesis can be a challenging procedure. One problem could be the needle not penetrating the pericardium. Now, if you're using a pericardiocentesis needle, you should be using it with the obturator to penetrate the pericardium. Otherwise, you'll have to apply quite a lot of force and there is an increased risk of touching the heart. It may, in fact, not penetrate the pericardium at all if it's in duly thickened. If you're experiencing this problem with a standard needle, then consider using a different approach and recognize that this may be the reason for the failure of your procedure. What about if the wire is definitely pericardial, but it isn't advancing or it's kinked as you try to advance it and you can't now use that wire to get your drain in? In this situation, taking a four French dilator, if you're not sure if it's pericardial, if you're definitely sure it's pericardial, then you can take a six French or even larger dilator. That will pass much more easily than the drain and gives you a good chance of getting your dilator back into the pericardium. Take a fresh wire once you've kinked it. Uh, the wire that goes down a pericardial needle is generally finer than the standard guide wire. And once you've got a dilator in, you can put a standard guide wire in and that will be a better railroad for your drain. Either way, if you let your wire advance as you're trying to push your drain in, both advance together and that leads to kinking of the wire. It's very important to keep the wire taut, not to pull because you don't have to pull the wire out, although you generally speaking don't need to worry about pulling the wire out, uh, but you've got to keep it taut so that it doesn't kink so that you can advance the drain. What if you're unable to advance the drain either due to thickened pericardium or uh, other structures on en route to the pericardium. Well, in this situation, uh, the, the dilator from the, the drain kit may not be large enough to, uh, to allow for the drain to pass. And so you can take dilator from different types of pacing uh, split sheath. Uh, so those go up to nine French commonly, uh, even larger if you do uh, need extractions and you have those pieces of kit around. But I wouldn't generally expect you to need anything larger than a nine French uh, dilator to, uh, if you can pass that, then I'd be confident that you can then get your, um, your, your drain in and you could consider taking the fresh wire at that point. Um, if you're really struggling, then sometimes using a very stiff wire, we have uh, Amplatz super stiff wires we use for TAVI procedures, which can very rarely be uh, of help to you, but usually simply dilating the track and taking a standard wire rather than the pericardiocentesis wire would be enough. Let's consider some special circumstances with the procedure. Probably the most dreaded complication of any procedure is tamponade caused by either putting a pacemaker in or doing a PCI or uh, doing an EP procedure. These situations are serious because the fluid accumulates rapidly, causes the patient to go into tamponade and become very unwell rapidly. They rapidly proceed to further deterioration in front of you. And when you're doing the procedure, you can expect it to be frank blood, which will then clot. So it will behave just like uh, the needle is in the right ventricle from the point of view of the appearances of the fluid. And your margin forever is much smaller because it's a smaller pericardial effusion. Add to that the stress of the procedure, the fact that it's been caused by you, I would recommend getting help from a colleague when doing an acute procedural tamponade, at least to be there for moral support and potentially to be there to do the pericardiocentesis. It takes the, some of the added stress out of the procedure if they're doing it, but particularly expect the blood-stained fluid. Um, you expect blood-stained fluid in uh, 
malignant pericardial synthesis procedures. So again, you can be prepared there, but it is it behaves exactly like blood in an emergency procedural complication. I often get asked about cabbage and lima grafts. What uh, about the risk of, of hitting the lima graft? Well, if you're avoiding the internal mammary artery, uh, you should be able to avoid the uh, lima graft. And I'll show you an x-ray image in a moment of the clips that the surgeons put on to clip the branches of the, the internal mammary artery that you can use to see where it is. Uh, recurrent pericardial effusion? Well, in this circumstance, the pericardium may be thicker, but in particular, you're thinking of solutions to it. So the thoracic team can do a relatively minor procedure to fenestrate the um, pericardium so that the fluid will drain harmlessly either into the thorax or the abdomen. Um, it's also possible to do that um, as part of a pericardiosynthesis procedure, uh, but obviously you need the expertise to do that, which I'm not going to cover in this lecture. So you might want to refer to somebody who can do that at the time of putting the drain in. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia is uh, a, a not particularly special in terms of how we do the procedure, but this is a condition that we do see as cardiologists, uh, but we see rarely, and it's very much outside of our area of expertise. This is important because it tends to affect young people, and it's an emergency condition in which their, their uh, status can deteriorate very rapidly. And to make the diagnosis, a fresh sample of pericardial fluid can be incredibly valuable, but it has to be fresh. If you let it sit in the drain for hours, the cells will have broken and, and be no use to the hematology team. So this is an emergency for the patient to develop, uh, to, to get the diagnosis potentially. It can, can be relatively stable for weeks and then patients can deteriorate very rapidly. And getting a fresh sample to the hematologist is essential. So consider this in patients with undiagnosed cause of their pericardial effusion, particularly if they have lymph nodes. Aortic dissection and myocardial rupture are two scenarios in which you might get uh, hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. And in both of these circumstances, the patient might be in tamponade and might need an emergency pericardial drain. But what they really need is emergency surgery to fix the cause of the pericardial effusion. And if you relieve the pressure by putting in a pericardial drain, that could actually make the dissection worse or the myocardial rupture worse. So if you could recognize these conditions, really they need to go for emergency surgery. So consider those as a possibility in the acutely unwell patient when they present to you. What about if you've put the drain in and you've done your best to make uh, sure that you're in the right place, but unfortunately you've cited it incorrectly and you've put it into the right ventricle or the left ventricle. What do you do in that circumstance? Well, that's obviously not good news, but have a plan for it if it happens. I would suggest to you that it's important to get another drain in straight away and that the incorrectly cited drain can stay put while you put that additional pericardial drain in. Once you've got that second drain in, you then need to think about removing the incorrectly cited drain. Now, if it's in the right ventricle, it's probably not doing any immediate harm. If it's in the left ventricle, um, then there's a risk of blood clots forming on it. Obviously, you don't want to be draining from anything if, uh, if it's incorrectly cited. Now, we don't want to anticoagulate the patient, so we need to think how is our strategy for getting that drain out. And I would suggest phoning the surgeons, particularly if you're at a surgical site. But the vast majority of the time when you pull out a drain that's been incorrectly cited, the hole closes because the heart's a muscular structure and the muscle closes down around the hole. So usually you will get away with this, particularly if it's in the left ventricle because it's a much thicker structure. But there is a risk, um, particularly if it's in the right ventricle or, or even worse in the atrium, that the hole created by the drain going in um, allows blood to continue to drain out into the pericardium. 
Now in that situation they might need emergency surgery to close the hole and you might need to look at uh, an autologous uh, transfusion system um, while you're, uh, you're getting the surgeons to do that. Um, so involve them but get another drain in and then think about removing it and you would have to take uh, yeah, use your own judgment for that very specialized circumstance i can't obviously advise for every scenario that that might happen in this is a diagram of uh, a internal mammary artery uh, graft onto the left anterior descending artery remember the sternum is here and this is why we're particularly worried about damaging if we go parasternally the uh, lad there are often clips. Can you see the little clips that the surgeon has put on the branches of the internal mammary artery that extend upwards? So you can see in this patient where the internal mammary artery is, and you can see that you can safely, safely go apically, or you could safely, safely go parasternally. And uh, just a better diagram, zoom in on, on those clips.